Hi everyone, I'm Marcel Dinger and I'm uh, giving the presentation this morning. Welcome everyone and thank you for attending. Um, so, I'm from the Garvin Institute and I'm presenting today on lighting up the dark matter of the genome. Are we working okay? So we'll move on to the first slide. Jenny, you there? Yeah, I advanced it and it says, sorry, an error has occurred, please try again. So I click it off. Yeah. Just give me one second, please. We're just restarting. Oh, we can do video mic. Let me give you a Sorry guys, we're just having a small technical problem. We have to... Okay, how are we doing now? I can see myself now. I can I can see my slides. Yeah, and they're progressing now without an error. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, let's try that again, folks. I'm um, sorry about the small technical problem there. This is Marcel Dinger speaking from Sydney, Australia. We're going to talk today about lighting up the dark matter of the genome, unraveling non-coding DNA and disease and development. So as many of you will have, uh, recall, uh, it was a long time ago, back in the 1990s, when uh, gene estimates were first, um, were, first, were, were first started to be estimated. And it was, it was understood initially through DNA and RNA uh, hybridization experiments that there were between sort of 30 and 40,000 or so human genes. Then later on, as, they, um, as there were experiments done to calculate the overall size of the genome, it was worked out that the human genome was in the ballpark of around about three gigabases. So assuming a rough calculation of 30 KB per gene, which was the approximate size from the small number of genes that had been sequenced at that time, that there were maybe 100,000 genes. It followed on from there that the, um, using CPG island density, which uh, predict promoters, that there were about 80,000 genes. And then EST sequencing uh, commenced in, in, in full stream in the mid-90s, and they came up with a gene estimates of around about 88,000 genes. And then from there, um, <clears throat> in early 2000s, when the human genome was being sequenced, uh, it became clear that, that uh, there were many estimates that ranged very widely, from 27,000 to 150,000, with an average of around 75,000. Of course, it's all ancient history now, but when the human genome was finally published and annotated in 2003, the numbers first came in at about 24,500, and later to around about a, a, a very surprisingly low, well below anyone's estimate of around 20,000. This seemed a huge paradox and a tremendous... Uh, uh, surprise to everyone for the reason that as further genomes were sequenced, including uh, mouse and in C. elegans, that we all seem to have similar numbers of protein coding genes across the entire, um, pretty much the whole animal kingdom. Then we look to uh, other organisms like paramecium and, and the sponge, and they actually had more genes than we did. This was some surprise. Now, later on, uh, a few years later, whole genome tiling arrays and large scale cDNA uh, sequencing started to be undertaken. And this, this changed the picture somewhat because 
All this non-coding DNA that, it, that was across in these genomes seemed to in fact be expressed. So we came in with the theory that perhaps the, the additional complexity and the vastly greater number of cell types that were present in mammals could perhaps be reconciliated by um, the expression and use of non-coding RNAs. So non-coding RNAs seem to be uh, recognized increasingly as, as uh, key components of the regulatory architecture of complex organisms. So there are many examples of this known. So this wasn't an enormously revolutionary in itself. So in 1992, EXIST was identified, which uh, compensates for the dosage of the X chromosome um, by silencing the X chromosome in females. And similarly, the, um, the um, AIR recruits the histone methyltransferase to silence uh, genes in the IGF2R locus during early development. And Further, more and more non-coding RNAs were identified on a sort of a one-by-one -one basis, which seemed to have a variety of different functions. So just how many long non-codings are there encoded in the mammalian genome? So it turns out that most of the, of the genome is actually transcribed as non-coding RNAs. So our original conception of, of, uh, of the genome, where we had genes sort of scattered as islands um, in an ocean of DNA, with the sort of occasional gene every few hundred kV, seem to have changed considerably once RNA sequencing started in earnest. So, for example, we now see that if we look to the genome browser, that in fact when we look at a protein coding gene, we see it enshrouded by a cloud of non-coding RNAs and non-coding transcripts. So this was shown initially by large-scale cDNA sequencing, and then um, and later it was substantiated by tiling arrays. So there was an initial um, idea that perhaps these things were artifacts of, uh, of transcription and what was, what was really going on there. So what happened later is that we then uh, started to sequence more and more and more of these, these, this type of, um, of these RNAs and started to understand more about its function. If we look now to ENCODE, we actually see that there's a, a dramatic increase in the number of um, of non-coding RNAs that are actually annotated in the human genome. So at the moment, GenCode records approximately 15,000 transcripts. So the question then became is, to what extent are these things actually functional? So long non-coding RNA, um, when I came in in the uh, early 2000s, was to examine the expression of these using non-coding uh, gene expression arrays. This may seem like an ancient technology now, but um, uh, but today, this seems to be a, a, um, a very, very effective approach for, at the time at least, was a very effective approach for uh, assaying gene expression. We use these arrays to look at long non-coding RNA expression in a huge number of disease systems and developmental systems. So perhaps the most iconic of these experiments was, um, was, was, was looking at uh, embryonic stem cell differentiation. So what we did was look at a 16-day time course of uh, embryonic stem cells. And what you can see in the top panel, uh, those genes that associate with, um, with, different, with, a, with different markers of pluripotency, such as OCT4, in the middle with primitive uh, streak formation, such as brachyuri and mesoinunid odin formation, which is um, marked by IGF. So when we look at RNAs that cluster with these non-coding RNAs, we can see that um, that we, we actually end up with a large number of non-coding RNAs that, that cluster with these same programs. So this gave us the, the first clue, really, that these non-coding RNAs may actually have a functional role rather than just being um, a, a consequence of spurious transcription. We looked at a, a, a very large number of these different transcripts over a, um, over a period of time, and it became clear that actually hundreds or perhaps even thousands of these were functional in a, a diversity of different cell systems. What was perhaps most notable about these different studies that we undertook in this time was, was not just the different non-coding RNAs that we identified that were relevant in different contexts, but perhaps more specifically that, that every one of these different systems uh, expressed different suites of long non-coding RNAs in different stages of development. We would expect this. Um, this led to a, the idea that we would then also expect that long non-coding RNAs should also be necessarily expressed in a spatially specific pattern. So in 2007, uh, using the, um, a, a genome-wide atlas of, of gene expression in the adult mouse brain that was performed by the Allen Brain Institute, we were actually able to look at the expression of long non-coding RNAs in, um, from a tissue-specific expression point of view. So 
in essence, for those of you not familiar with the study, is that essentially what they did is they take mouse brains and they're, they are sliced and diced um, uh, ventrally and dorsally, and then using in situ hybridization, you could examine the expression in, sort of in, a, in 3D space of, um, of transcripts in the mouse brain. Now, the initial idea of this study was in fact to look at, um, was in fact to look at long non-coding RNAs, uh, or sorry, it was to look at messenger RNAs. However, the, um, the, the, um, the pools that they used uh, came from, uh, sort of from a much larger cDNA libraries. And when we investigated these libraries, we actually found that about a thousand of them contained non-coding RNAs. So this was tremendously interesting to us and gave us a huge opportunity to actually investigate expression of long non-coding RNAs using this um, really quite spectacular technology. So it, it, it does indeed turn out that our hypothesis was right, that non-coding RNAs are also expressed in a very tissue-specific manner in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in tissues. So these are just a few examples of um, RNAs in, for example, the hippocampus. And in the heat map below, you can see sort of in B, C, and D, I think this will come up. There you go. You can see expression there specifically in the dentate gyrus, the CA1 uh, region, and here co-expression in the CA1 and dentate gyrate region. Similarly, if we look at the expression of long non-coding RNAs in the cerebellum, we see similar patterns where, again, for almost every non-coding RNA, we're able to identify very specific locations where non-coding RNAs are expressed. So, for example, here in the granular and... Um, and molecular layers of the cerebellum, we're able to delineate almost every single tissue type and cell type in the brain by a different long non-coding RNA. And in fact, when we go further and look at the subcellular localization of long non-coding RNA, such as in Purkinje cells, which were large enough to be able to actually resolve some, some degree of subcellularity, we also see remarkable patterns of expressions. For example, um, RNAs that are specific to the soma, the nucleus, uh, some that are expressed in twin foci and others that are expressed in multiple foci. And finally, as well, in neurites. So together, this information seemed to, um, seemed to really uh, be uh, s certainly very contrary to suggestions that long non-coding RNAs were simply spurious or unstable transcripts, um, especially because of the fact that they could be detected by in situ hybridization, which really um, gave us the idea that, wait a minute, this idea that these that non-coding RNAs should be just expressed randomly and are just quickly broken down didn't seem to be right. However, at the time, there was absolutely no documentation or um, there was no, um, no reports at all on, uh, on the stability of non-coding RNAs. So this is the next investigation that we undertook. So, it, so to do this, again, we used microarrays to examine the stability of long non-coding RNAs in mouse neuroblastoma cells. So the experiment was reasonably straightforward. We take neuroblastoma cells and we um, inhibit expression of, uh, or sorry, we just inhibit RNA polymerase two with actinomycin D. And then we just take samples over a 32 hour time course. And effectively from this, we're able to calculate the half-life is of these non-coding RNAs. So this is um, to give an idea of what the results of this type of study looks like. So for example, this is MIC, which has a very a reasonably short half-life half of around 33 minutes, which is typical of a tra transcription factor. If we go to something like, um, like GATAD1, which is a, uh, another protein coding gene, this is a very, very long half-life of around 29 hours. And finally, here is an example of a non-coding RNA, which is a half-life of, say, four hours. So when we take all this data collectively and we put it together to see, well, what does this look like on a, um, on a genome-wide basis, we end up with something that looks a bit like this. So... Although it's true that overall, long non-coding RNAs are, are, um, are less stable than messenger RNAs, uh, we still see that overall there is a dramatic diversity in the stability of long non-coding RNAs and that they don't have a half-life that's really all that much different to, um, to messenger RNAs, which again is um, sort of builds more support that, that these are transcripts are in fact regulated post-transcriptionally as well as um, at the transcript level, suggesting that they might be well be functional. So I guess the next logical thing to move on to is, 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 is what, sort of, um, what sort of expression do we actually see in these transcripts and what sort of functions do we see? So there are many ideas about the different functions and this is a, uh, and, and it seems in fact that every non-coding RNA that's been characterized seems to have a slightly different function or different mechanism. So long non-coding RNAs are nothing like microRNAs which have a very distinct or specific expression profile and in fact, um, uh, sorry, a very distinct um, 
functional mechanism through which they operate. So for, for instance, a microRNA, which um, binds to the 3' UTR, is going to, uh, in that way, lead to the um, degradation of that transcript. Long non-coding RNAs don't seem to fulfill this at all. So the first example of a function of a non-coding RNA that's been expressed, so all of these have, uh, have, have been described um, uh, is, is, is a decoy, which is a reasonably civil, trivial and simple way of thinking about this. So uh, as the uh, I, um, illustration indicates, we normally see that uh, proteins will interact with uh, the DNA double helix, but similarly an RNA can also assume a very similar form to DNA, and in doing so can also attract and bind to, um, to uh, transcription factors or other DNA binding proteins as a sort of a mechanism uh, to uh, act as perhaps as a sponge or as a decoy to uh, um, affect the numbers of protein coding gene, uh, number of proteins that are affecting to DNA. Uh, so sort of like a dosage response mechanism. Um, as a second uh, uh, method is, is to serve as a scaffold. So because um, RNA is, is, um, is, has got a huge capability to be able to bind very specifically to different proteins, it can in that way also serve very effectively as a scaffold and in that way bring um, uh, different proteins into close proximity, so acting almost like as a chaperone type role. And a further example has been recently described or over the last couple of years is that in fact they can also uh, um, aid as, a, as part of the mechanism to serve as enhancers. So almost all enhancers, if not all enhancers, are transcribed as, as non-coding RNAs and the existing model that we have now is that these non-coding RNAs then interact as they're expressed from the enhancer with other proteins, which then serve to alter the uh, 3D structure of the genome to bring, um, to bring proteins into proximity for expression. Uh, and as a, as a last example, which is perhaps the most tantalizing and interesting to date, is, is, is where non-coding RNAs can in fact function as a guide. So in this sense, uh, proteins use um, specifically bind to, um, to DNA and, um, sorry, let's just start that again. So in this example, what we, the way that the, um, the non-coding RNA works is by, is by forming a very specific base pairing interaction with the DNA and in doing so is actually recruiting proteins um, to, the, that, to that location on the, uh, to the DNA. So this is especially relevant where we think about um, proteins that have got a very uh, generic role but need to be recruited to very specific places in the, um, in the genome. So this is perhaps best typified by chromatin modification enzymes. So if we think about this, um, about the dramatic number of uh, different uh, chromatin um, modifications that we see around the genome, and there is something like a, a, around 150 or so that have now been described, although each of these, is, these modifications is catalyzed by a different um, it's catalyzed by a different enzyme. Uh, we have to remember that each of these these locations that are that are on on the genome where these modifications occur is incredibly specific and has to happen at very specific times in very specific places. So this is just a zoom in of that, just so you can see the detail of this. But these are histone tails and showing all the different chemical modifications that can occur to them. And if we think about the tremendous complexity of this and how this can happen over a substrate of some three billion or so base pairs of DNA and that we get very specific modifications occurring at very specific times and places, we need to think about how can that possibly be catalyzed and what brings these things there. So the theory is now perhaps that, that non-coding RNAs are in fact themselves um, being used as a mechanism to recruit this generic chromatin modifying machinery to very specific locations in the genome. So there's a, a number of examples of this now that have been described in the literature. The first and most iconic of these would be um, is the link RNA hot air, which recruits the polycomb repressive complex from the, um, which is exp um, from, so hot, hot air itself is expressed from the Hox D loci, recruits PCR2 to the, uh, to the, Hox, um, to the Hox B loci, which is really a, a, a remarkable and extremely interesting mechanism. I think I got that right. And then um, in our own work, we also described the, um, the expression of the HOXB5-6 antisense um, RNA or EVX1 antisense, which seems to recruit MLL1 back to the, uh, to the, uh, the HOXB loci. So this is, these are intriguing mechanisms. So MLL1 is a, a histone demethyltransferase. So we anticipate that there are many more of these functions. And in fact, when you, um, 
do a, a co communo precipitation with P PSE2 and sequence the RNA, um, so a so called RIP seq experiment, you, um, some, some 700 RNAs were identified, 20% 20, 20 or so, which were link RNAs that actually co precipitated with PRC2, which really supports this idea that non coding RNAs are bringing, um, um, are bringing this generic machinery to specific loci. So I think that the conclusion perhaps that we can start to draw from this, and as we grow more and more examples of functional non coding RNAs, it becomes hard to distinguish perhaps what the difference is between a gene, a, a traditional protein coding gene as we think of it, and a non coding RNA. And we have for some time now put forward the notion that non coding RNAs can in every way be considered as genes. They functionally regulate and, uh, uh, and affect the phenotype of, a, of an organism in very much the same way as a gene does. And so it could perhaps be considered akin to a transcription factor or indeed even an epigenetic modifying factor. So you, once we actually put long coding RNAs back onto this graph, which I showed at the start of the talk, you'll see that the, that the number of, of, our, of uh, long non coding RNA loci, which as I said, numbers to somewhere between 15 and 20,000 with uh, current estimates and annotations, actually doubles the number of protein coding genes. And that our graph now starts to resemble suspiciously the initial experiments that were done in the pre early, uh, in the pre 1990s, which estimated some 40,000 or so different RNAs in the human genome. So perhaps this was more insightful than was ever anticipated. Oh, so sorry. So the next, um, the next thing I want to move on to in, this, in, the, in the talk is how can we rule out that long non-coding RNAs do in fact not insert themselves in code proteins? And this was a question that we were often asked and again had never been um, addressed in any specific way. So when we think about a long non-coding RNA, uh, which can often be in the, in, you know, they range sort of arbitrarily really from 200 nucleotides through, through to several thousand nucleotides in length. It becomes incredibly clear that these things can actually uh, just um, by chance alone be able to um, encode a, a protein. So that's exactly what we see here. So what this graph is, is demonstrating is it's just taken, uh, if you model random uh, nucleotides into a transcripts of various lengths, and then work out how long an auth is by chance, an open reading frame is by chance, we actually find that about 5% of, um, there's about a 50% chance of having an open reading frame of more than 70 codons in a, uh, in a transcript of 2000 nucleotides. So we, we, there were many informatics sort of methods that had started to be used to see if you could predict, you know, how, how, how do these things actually change? So, um, in terms of how are these, is this occurring randomly or are these actually proteins? So this is where we introduced proteomics to see if we could use this as a mechanism to define as an empirical approach to see whether or not non-coding RNAs actually express proteins. So to do this, we actually turned to a public database known as the PRIDE database. So the PRIDE database contains um, some millions of different proteins. And what we did is we uh, combined this database with the Illumina body atlas which at the time was the, um, just a couple of years ago, was perhaps by far the most comprehensive description of the human transcriptome. So using um, deep sequencing, uh, this, this, uh, they, used, they looked at 16 different tissues uh, with roughly 100 million or so reads each. And then what we were able to do next was that we could um, uh, overlay the, um, the peptide tags back on onto this transcriptome and see what we could find. So to go through that as an overview, we assembled the transcriptome from these deep RNA-seq tissues, uh, deep, deep RNA-seq data um, across the 16 tissues, and then we map the peptide fragments back onto it. Okay, and then when you are able to do that, it's incredibly instructive because it tells you exactly what the actual open reading frame is. So even though the proteomics will only give you a very small amount of the protein sequence, it, um, it gives you the reading frame absolutely, which uh, informatically can't, can't be predicted, or at least there's six possibilities for every, um, uh, in a given, a given um, part of DNA. So from this, you're able to uh, um, reasonably confidently predict the uh, open reading frame and predict which transcripts actually encode proteins. So we did this and we, uh, so from this RNA-seq database, there were roughly 32,000 uh, long non-coding RNAs and about, um, of these, about 2,000 um, were indeed uh, protein coding, um, so low size. So 
and of those about 700 actually had three or more peptides mapped. So that's, that gives a level of confidence. So there were about 2000 that had two peptides mapping and about 700 that had three peptides mapping. So it was maybe 10% of, uh, of, um, of the long non-coding RNAs that had been annotated as non-coding were actually in fact possibly just novel proteins that hadn't been described previously. In the study, we also identified another, a number of other proteins that, that actually occurred in quite unusual regions, such as in introns, which may have resembled uh, alternate, tra um, alternate transcripts, as well as pseudogenes, which were also interestingly translated in some occasions. So when we actually look at this as a, again, a, on a genome-wide scale, we actually see a very interesting pattern. So the blue line just shows the distribution of ORF sizes, of open reading frame sizes, of all RefSec genes. So it's roughly what you'd expect that, you know, um, you end up with uh, um, a, a fairly broad distribution between uh, 100 and 700 or so amino acids. Now, if we look at the red line, these are the novel genes that we identified using this proteomics analysis. And in fact, what we see is a huge spike at around about the 100 and 120 um, uh, codon uh, level. And this was, these, these spikes actually coincide exactly with where the, um, where the human genome annotators had, had, had done their own cutoffs. So there was an arbitrary cutoff of, uh, of 100 amino acids where it was like, if the open reading frame is less than 100 amino acids, then we don't call it a protein. And if it's more, then we call it a protein. So what this you, by bringing this data in, we're actually able to informatically predict these other largely small novel proteins. And in fact, many of these were lineage specific, tissue specific, and also many had secretion signals. So these were really had all the hallmarks of, um, of functional proteins. So this was an interesting analysis. When we, we bring this data together with the new transcriptomic data back to this graph, we again actually see uh, quite intriguingly that the, the number of, um, of, 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 of genes in the genome continues to rise. And that now the number perhaps starts to look more like around 50,000. Um, which is, is, is quite interesting. And we start seeing growth again in the number of protein coding genes when we start to look deeper and when we start to bring together different data sets of information. So having said all this at this, at this, at this time, uh, it, it, it sounds as we sort of started to ask the question, well, look, if these things are genes and they have this, this dramatic repertoire of, of, uh, of functions, then surely we might anticipate as well that, um, that these non-coding RNAs should also be um, uh, involved in disease. Yet they'd so often be uh, considered in this context. Now, although it, there were in, in, increasing numbers of papers, again, as I said, it, uh, very much similar to the, the start of this talk, there were individual examples that seemed to indicate an involvement of long non-coding RNA, uh, RNAs in disease, but no one had ever looked at this on a genome-wide scale. So there were examples where they were involved in Alzheimer's disease, breast cancer, melanoma, and you name it. Um, and in fact, by this time, about 400 or so non-coding RNAs had been, ascribed a very sp had been prescribed a specific function. But what we were wondering is just how many more were there? How many more non-coding RNAs were actually involved in disease? Could these be therapeutic targets or different diagnostic markers that we could use for disease? At a similar time, these, um, a number of papers that had started to be described uh, looking at GWAS, um, GWAS studies. So over the last sort of six or seven years, Roughly in the order of almost 2,000 GWAS studies have been undertaken on a diverse number of different diseases. So for those of you not familiar, a GWAS uh, study is essentially where you take um, typically complex diseases. You take a, um, you use a, um, a genotyping, a SNP array to look at, um, at the presence of, of, of particular single nucleotide polymorphisms across two populations of uh, a disease and a control. And then you look for enrichments of uh, particular genotypes or particular polymorphisms. And you end up with plots like, or like what you see there on the right, the so-called Manhattan plots, where you get an association of a SNP in, a, in a, a region of the genome. And then people would then from there go hunting to see what does this, what does this mean? Now, the curious observation that comes when you actually bring all of these studies together is in fact that there are um, that there are, that of these thousands of studies, only a very, very small number actually land in non synonymous coding regions. And only a very small number land within the coding region of a gene at all. And in fact, the vast, vast majority uh, of these regions end up nowhere near protein coding genes. They can be within uh, introns where the entire liquid, the equilibrium block is a long way away from any exon. And they can, so they can also be intergenic.
And we sort of asked the question from our perspective, could it be that these were actually, uh, that these diseases were in fact associated with non-coding RNAs? So the results are typically interpreted that um, perhaps these are, you know, non-coding DNA regulatory elements. But what about long non-coding RNAs? So that's what we sought to look at next. Now, interestingly, the majority of, uh, or a very large number of, uh, of transcripts, of long non-coding transcripts, are indeed lowly expressed. So in this plot, which came from ENCODE, uh, first of all, on the left, you can see the box and whisker plot showing the level of expression in different tissues. And consistently across the board, you'll always see that there are a far, far greater number of protein coding genes that are, um, that are highly expressed across all tissues and that non-coding RNAs are quite consistently shown in blue there as having lower expression. And if we look on the panel on the right, what you'll see there is that the number of, um, so that shows the, the breadth of expression. So this is the number of, um, the number of RNAs that are expressed in a specific tissue type. So as you can see, the vast, the overwhelming majority of, of long non-coding RNAs are actually expressed in, um, in, a, in a very small number of tissues. And conversely, shown in red, messenger RNAs are commonly expressed in all tissues. So this leads to a problem when we uh, use RNA sequencing, for example, to try and identify and characterize non-coding uh, non RNAs. So RNA-seq, just by the nature and way that it works, is uh, when you do a typical experiment, the most abundant 1.5% of transcripts take up almost half of the reads, and these are almost exclusively messenger RNAs, while only just 1% of reads measure the least abundant 44% of the detected transcripts. So if we keep in mind that the expression of non-coding transcripts is very low, what we, what we would typically see when we... Um, when we do an RNA-seq experiment, that we end up with a fairly scarce coverage of RNA-seq over long non-coding transcripts, especially if we take a very specific tissue type. Uh, sorry, if we take a, um, a, a tissue type that's got a, a large um, degree of heterogeneity or a large number of different um, uh, cell types in it. So this gives the idea, it gives the indication that um, if you take these non-homogeneous preparations, that it gives the appearance of that, that these may just be uh, low background signals or just artifact. And in fact, they just may appear as single tags, for example, and it's not sure if these things are actually clear. So to increase the coverage of rare transcripts, you require an exponential increase in read depth, which becomes incredibly expensive. So to, to address this, we, we, we try to consider how, how we, what other methods might be possible to use to be able to um, uh, to assemble and quantify rare transcripts. And then together with, um, with John Rin's lab in, uh, at Harvard, we, um, we developed this method called RNA capture seq. So RNA capture seq is actually a very simple approach that combines uh, capture, um, uh, DNA capture technology with next generation sequencing. So the first step is that you simply, very much like an exo, like a custom exome array, you, um, you design design an array that contains probes that are targeted to, um, uh, that target different regions of the genome. You then take the uh, RNA sequencing library and, and put this over top of the array and then transcripts of interest are captured and the rest are washed away. So effectively what this does, it's kind of like you could almost consider it as an anti-exome um, where you end up just capturing only the reasons that you're interested in and you throw away the other RNA and this is the only stuff that you sequence. So. What this actually, um, what happened when we did this in our first pilot experiment, which was um, uh, published just, just two years ago now, is that we, we use this to target a number of intergenic regions in the, um, uh, in the, in the human, um, in the, uh, oh, sorry, so intergenic regions in the transcriptome to see, is there, are there actually transcripts arising from these regions? So what this is, circos plot shows is each of those segments is a different region of the genome that we targeted. Some of these regions were actually protein coding, but the vast majority were intergenic. What this shows um, is, is the, is the, uh, the pre-assemble, uh, sorry, the pre-capture um, uh, pre RNA-seq over the same samples. And as you can see, you only see a very small number of splice junctions as indicated by those loops. When we then do capture-seq, was it a, a um, really was, was quite a uh, sort of a eureka moment where we saw there was this um, a remarkable number of, of novel um, transcripts and splice junctions that were identified through this process. 
And in fact, even in protein coding loci, they were absolutely transformed into, uh, into these very long um, and complex interlaced transcripts that we saw. Um, so for example, the slides come out funny, but you can still see here the, um, uh, in, the, in the icon above, a very small number of, um, uh, of what's normally annotated. And then when we use CaptureSeq, you see this dramatic um, uh, increase in numbers of splice junctions that are identifiable. So when we look back to, um, to a protein coding region, such as something incredibly well studied like the Hox loci, it's a very curious observation that gets made. So in the top panel there in A, you can see um, uh, the existing gene annotations of the uh, Hox B loci and RefSeq. What's shown underneath it in the, in the bottom half of that panel in A are all the novel transcripts that we identified just in the Hox loci alone, the vast majority of which, some 100, almost 89, uh, sorry, 89 novel transcripts and 19 novel isoforms in just that region alone. So you, there's a tremendous amount of discovery. What you can see there in B uh, below is what you actually see in a wiggle plot in the genome browser in terms of the depths of reads. So in green is showing the um, tag mapping by conventional RNA-seq where you get maybe 19 tags and in the lower using CaptureSeq you amplify this by almost 10,000 fold or more than 10,000 fold coverage over that same region. So back to our question about disease. It seemed now that this was a, an, an optimal um, uh, an optimal technique or method in which we were able to use this to actually investigate these, these, G, these GWAS li li um, linkage blocks to try and investigate were there actually non-coding RNAs being expressed from these regions of the genome. So we designed an array that captured about 50 megabases of the genome um, and all of these regions were completely non-coding, they were either intergenic or, uh, or intronic. So in total, these actually identi uh, these, these targeted some 150 different regions, uh, sorry, 150 different traits and diseases um, uh, across 339 or so regions. So there were large numbers of diseases. We just put them all together and then we just used um, the total RNA as a, uh, from, from uh, a, pooled, a pooled RNA source to look at whether or not we could identify whether there were transcripts expressed from these regions. So first of all, the experiment worked very well. So we had a, a, a very large capture source here of some 50, uh, 50 megabase region. So as you can see, pre-capture over this region versus uh, post-capture, you end up with about a 336 fold enrichment of expression. So effectively what that means is that for every tag that you would have gotten uh, in one of these regions with conventional RNA-seq, you got 336 tags when we used uh, capture-seq. So it gives a, a vast, um, an absolutely huge boost in the signal. So in summary, what we found in the study was that we identified, in fact, um, about 1,500 or so completely novel transcripts in these intergenic GWAS regions. Um, so compared to just 100 that were, uh, that were identifiable um, pre-capture. So the majority of these transcripts were completely novel and um, or uh, were either novel non-coding RNA genes or they were identified as novel exons of, of uh, distant genes. Um, so, and the majority were also, um, sorry, it was all there. So, so what does this look like? So when we actually uh, zoom in on one of these regions, we can examine what we see. So what we see there at the top of this uh, um, browser representation are the haplotype blocks that were targeted. And you can see there the green lines, which are the GWAS SNPs. So, then when we um, uh, reveal the, the transcripts that were actually expressed from those regions, this is what they look like. So in previous studies like GenCode, uh, sorry, in the annotations in GenCode and uh, the non-coding RNAs to identified um, um, in, in, uh, in other studies of non-coding RNAs, you can see this very scarce transcripts. And, and this capture seq, what it in fact does is it brings these, these sort of um, um, occasional exons that were lying around the place and it brings them all together and, and we can actually start to now assemble uh, things that really look like genes and look like complete um, transcripts that can be fully assembled. So this particular region was, um, was associated with prostate cancer in a large number of different studies and a very, very high p-value. And it would seem that these non-coding RNAs may be very, very interesting targets to pursue in terms of um, what, what causes this, the, the difference in etiology or susceptibility to prostate cancer that was associated with those GWAS studies. Sorry, this slide here is messed up. Um, 
a so this was another example where again so I'm not sure what's happened to the graphics here but what 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 that's representing is the is again a large number of of uh of a, that's a that's a snip and a liquid disequilibrium block and these are the assembled transcripts that we see um, below that were the uh, supposed to be the uh, encode tracks that show that there's not much else expressed there so these have been messed up in the conversion process somehow um but again here we can see a a, a snip um, and the tracks below there is the encode tracks shown in green which shows that there's always no transcription at all and then we look at the transcription that's revealed um, through cufflinks uh, um, uh, after we identify these using RNA capture seq we see a dramatic number of novel transcripts in these regions so just to summarize the data of the 339 target regions about 290 of them contain splice transcripts um, so it was about 86 percent of the regions we looked at we actually found transcription and in these cases, about 54% of, of the captured area were in fact covered by splice transcription. So if we go back finally now to our graph and we look at our technologies and um, uh, uh, if we think of, if we take into account now uh, a technology like CaptureSeq, which identifies this dramatically larger number of, um, of, 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 of new transcripts in the human genome, the graph starts to look quite different and that perhaps we can now start to head back towards those lofty gene counts in the, in the, in the ballpark of 100,000. So I think this is an interesting illustration of how things change with time and how different technologies and different theories and ideas can really influence uh, the way that we perceive the genome and, and how we think about this. So I'll close down with a summary. Um, so together we can see that new technologies have provided a, a, an increasingly complex picture a vastly complex, more complex repertoire of, uh, of the human transcriptome that reveals thousands of novel transcripts and isoforms, each of which show highly regulated expression. Long non-coding RNA should, should in every way really be considered as genes. They function similarly and uh, are regulated similarly and can uh, affect phenotype and disease in similar ways. Long non-coding RNAs are, are, are show a remarkably uh, temporal and spatially specific expressed which is perhaps at least provides some explanation as to how these um, uh, weren't considered or seen previously in, in earlier studies and, and uh, how they were perhaps overlooked for so many years. And it hasn't really been until uh, new technologies such as transcriptomic sequencing and now um, and RNA capture sequencing where it's become possible to actually identify these transcripts and see what they really do. I just also want to mention that RNA capture seq is a uh, um, of a, a remarkably interesting technology that we see is as becoming a, a pivotal component in, um, uh, in, 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 in the study of, um, of RNA and its expression from the genome. So you could very much um, make this analogy of, of, of looking at the night sky in the evening where we might take a, uh, where you're in a city where there's a lot of background light and you may look up into the sky and see that there's just a handful of stars. When we use a, when we use a telescope, such as the Hubble telescope, for example, we see thousands and perhaps millions and billions more stars. And this is very much the same way that we felt when we uh, first used the RNA capture seq approach to look at, um, at RNA transcription. So um, the, as, a, as a closing remark, I just think that the, the identification and functional study of long, long coding RNAs is key in this interpretation to GWAS. And is it going to be, and that these transcripts may be incredibly valuable and useful for understanding uh, the molecular basis of disease. It is just the very fact that they are so specific and so particular in their expression that they may, um, may really hold the keys in terms of being able to, to be those, the, um, those molecules that make those first and initial changes um, to when a cell type changes, for example, into something that's associated with disease or where the program starts to go wrong. And that these fine tuning regulators are actually key in the normal function of, uh, of complex life. So I'll finish with acknowledgements. Um, uh, the vast majority of the capture seq work, uh, certainly the wet work was entirely done by Michael Clark and Joan Crawford at the, um, at the Institute of Molecular Bioscience uh, and Tim Mercer. Uh, together with John Maddock, who I understand is actually speaking in parallel to me at the moment, um, and, uh, and the rest of the lab team here at the Garden Institute. Roche Nibbledon also uh, contributed to the development of the Capture Seek approach. And that's all. Thank you very much for attending this session, and I'm happy to take any questions from here. Thank you.
So we've got a question um, from Tammy at the University of Toledo, who asks if some of these tissues are uh, so, sorry, if some of these are tissue specific, is there any correlation with the tissue for which the long non-coding RNA is expressed in the disease phenotype? That's a great question. And the answer is absolutely yes, there is. So we've just come across, so in our initial study, and most of the data that um, I, I displayed here was done through a pilot study. So we had, uh, we had pooled RNA where the RNA was, came from you know, 16 different tissues. So we couldn't tell where the RNA was coming from. What we've done now is, in fact, have divided, uh, have repeated the experiment where we've done capture seq with 20 different tissues um, so that we're able to actually identify the source of that tissue. And so, for instance, we've seen some, some really nice examples now, for example, where we've seen GWAS regions that were associated, for example, with Crohn's disease, and we see very specific expression of these in the stomach and small intestine, for example. So we're seeing more and more of this happening. We also just saw a prostate cancer loci, which was also specifically expressed in the prostate, um, a long non-coding RNA that was yes, specifically expressed in the prostate and, um, and things like that. So uh, I do think that that's the indication. It's certainly not true across the board, but um, my anticipation is that as we grow and get more and more data to show this, where exactly, where and when these transcripts are expressed, we'll, have, we'll get a much better feeling for those associations. So if there's no other questions, we can perhaps finish there. Okay, if there's no more questions, I just thank everyone again for attending and we'll, um, we'll move on from here. Thank you.